first of all, I didn't say hello. Hello, grassroots. Hello. Do we have any patriots in the house today? Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm in front of the right crowd. And I'm going to tell you, I go from one end of this state to the other, and I like to tell you every time I'm here, this is the best looking crowd in Texas. talking about a little bit of business that he's going to conduct with and some members of the board with you all whenever we get done with the presentations. So what we're going to ask folks to do is the members, the dues paying members to stay here if you want to vote on your board members and then the rest of you guys can join the speakers out in the foyer and we'll be happy to meet and, and talk to you and uh, <laughs> answer some additional questions. And speaking of questions, this is the format with which we take questions, so be sure that as we go through the presentations today that you get your questions on the cards. Okay, on your tables, you have two very important pieces of information. One uh, is about the meeting that will be happening on uh, August the 21st and 22nd. My good friend Brandon Darby, a great patriot, great patriot. Uh, is going to be here and he's going to present to you the video that was made whenever we went to the border. Uh, we went to the border unannounced. We did not have a, a uh, canned guide take us through uh, the border and just show us the nice uh, fun things. We went down there and we were in some uh, pretty dangerous spots and I didn't tell my parents I was going before I went. <laughs> Uh, and I told my husband as I was on the side, we were on the banks of the Rio Grande uh, Valley, uh, the Rio Grande uh, River in the Rio Grande Valley sector uh, on a Friday night at about 10.30. No lights anywhere. There's about 17 of us going down this trail that I promise you a mountain goat shouldn't have been on. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, I will tell you that there's a slide in here that shows a lone border patrol agent. Many times they are by themselves. We got to witness that. We went uh, in there with no law enforcement with us whatsoever, but we did have some folks packing heat. Uh, so I will tell you that this documentary is very important for you to see. It's real. It has... Um, Border Patrol agents in it, the testimony of Border Patrol agents, who, by the way, are the only people qualified to talk about uh, whether or not this border is being patrolled and being secured, because it absolutely is not, and they will tell you that in their own words. Um, so I'm asking you to please choose. You can, you're welcome to come either time, August the 21st or the 22nd. You've got that information on your table. Anybody that's interested in the truth about the border, I would ask you to ask them to be here because you're going to hear things that, you know, from Brandon Darby and from the border agents that you won't hear anywhere else. And so uh, we're interested in the truth here, not political correctness, because this country is on fire because of a political correctness. All right. Um, then the other thing is Friday, August the 29th, you see here that we have a special speaker on terrorism, Dr. Jeffrey Atticott. Um, terrorism is a part of this conversation as well. Okay, now, Bob, I am ready for you to play the video. And you all play, pay very close attention to this video. It was put together by James O'Keefe of Project Veritas. And once you see it, you'll understand why it's important to the discussion today. Project Veritas has just returned from the U.S.-Mexican border. What we discovered there should worry every American. Here in West Texas, the border is just a muddy sliver of river. I'm at the Rio Grande River. I'm about to cross into the United States just like thousands of illegal immigrants do every single year.
The U.S. Border Patrol was nowhere in sight. It was obvious. This border is not secure. No one is on watch. Even Osama bin Laden could cross. The border is secure. That the border, from a security standpoint, is stronger than it's ever been. The fence is now basically complete. Sheriff, so we got this beautiful fence right here. Uh, goes all the way just about here, and then it just, I, I guess it, it ends, right? That's, that's, that's the end of it right here. <laughs> and if you wanted to get under this uh, fence, you just have to push it open, it's almost like a gate right there, and anyone can just get right through it. Just step right through it. Hudspeth County Sheriff Arvin West was our guide. His county, roughly 60 miles east of El Paso, straddles the Mexican border for 98 long miles. Illegal aliens and Mexican drug smugglers know the area well. So do you think our border is secure? You're looking at it. <laughs> if you think four strands of barbed wire is securing the border, then I guess it's secure. What, what, what do you think it would take to, to make our border secure? Well, the easiest, simplest way is put border truck back to the border. Sheriff West doesn't blame the agents on the ground. He blames the bosses in Washington. You hear the, the rumors of boots on the ground and more agents. And we've got plenty of agents. They just need to be on the border. Look around you. You can look miles and miles either direction and there's not a border truck. We wonder, what if we cross the river from Mexico into the United States? Would the Border Patrol catch us? I'm James O'Keefe. I'm standing in Mexico, Guadalupe, Mexico, across from Hutspeth County, West Texas. I'm about to cross a 15, maybe 20 foot wide river and cross into the United States just like many illegal immigrants do. And uh, we'll see how this goes. Not too challenging. And I'm in the United States, Hudspeth County. I don't see a single federal officer anywhere. No walls, no guns, no people. Totally peaceful, quiet, and serene. I'm in the United States. Let me tell you something. If the president or if Senator Reid or anyone else tries to tell you that our borders are secure, they are lying to you. Because that was just about the easiest thing I ever did. And it may be difficult to get all the way from South America to that point, but crossing that river, no problem. And if you don't want to get your feet wet, believe it or not, there's actually an old steel footbridge that crosses the river just a little ways upstream. 99.99999% of people in America d does not know this exists. But you don't understand, Washington paints the picture of how secure it is. Does the president know about this that it exists? Well, the, the question is, what, it doesn't matter whether or not he knows it or does he care. Right. That's the question. And I'm going to begin walking all the way to I-10, and uh, we'll see if anyone gets in my way. It's a six-mile walk from where I crossed over the Rio Grande in the United States to here. We're at Interstate 10. From here, I can get anywhere in the United States. When we looked on the U.S. Customs and Border Protection website, we were intrigued by what we read. The priority mission of the Border Patrol is preventing terrorists and terrorist weapons, including weapons of mass destruction, from entering the United States. Undaunted by scorching desert heat or freezing northern winters, they work tirelessly as vigilant protectors of our nation's borders. Not exactly true where we were, not by a mile, or two, or three. I'm James O'Keefe, I'm right in the center of the Mexican-American border, and I see no border patrol, I see no security. Uh, thousands of people have stood in my footsteps right now. They've come from South America, Honduras, Guatemala, 
and uh, they've all crossed the border. And if, if they can cross, anybody can cross. And I'm here today to ask you, do you feel safe? doing that, I want to make sure that everybody understands this. Grassroots America, We the People, supports legal immigration. People who will use the 29 different ports of entry, that are legal ports of entry for the state of Texas. Texas has more legal ports of entry than any other state in the United States. There are 29 legal entry points. Those are the entry points that should be used to enter the United States. Um, I also want to say that we do not fault the men and women of U.S. Border Patrol, the men and women that are on the ground. We don't fault the Department of Public Safety, the Rangers, the Game Wardens, the Sheriffs, the National Guard when they get there. We don't fault them. It is the failure of leadership in Washington and the bureaucracy to fulfill the obligations to secure our border. So I just wanna make sure that you all understand that we support law enforcement. And part of the reason that I am doing this is because I so much support law enforcement. They are being used as political pawns, pawns and props for political expediency and it's wrong. It's wrong to do that to the United States military, and it's wrong to do it to law enforcement. And so as, you, as we go through this, you remember the video you saw. Okay, the name of my presentation here is The Great Betrayal, and I define that as the smoke and mirrors, the dog and pony shows, and the slick political posturing that equals a dangerous wide open border with Mexico. And for those of you who don't know me very well, you're going to find out that I'm very, very direct. Uh, th this is a serious issue here. And as we go through these presentations today, you will see that your life, your liberty, and your property is in jeopardy because your government has failed you. Now, somebody that wants to take that out of context and wants to say, well, Joanne Fleming is anti-government, you better believe I'm anti-big government that fails to uphold the United States Constitution. Okay. The first slide here is the Rio Grande Valley sector. Uh, the part that is on the border is th represents 320 miles of 1,254 miles of the Rio Grande uh, River that is the Texas border with Mexico. In 2012, we tied with Tucson, which is the busiest and most deadly border crossing in the United States. So the DPS surge, as you look at this, you need to understand the DPS surge and the majority of the border agents in Texas are concentrated in this one sector, okay? The next is the Laredo sector. Uh, it represents 171 miles on a river out of 1,254 miles, and it is the fourth busiest sector based on apprehensions. And you will notice that the Laredo sector goes all the way up to Dallas. That's important for you to remember because the Department of Public Safety has rated Dallas-Fort Worth as a major command and control center for six of the eight most dangerous cartels in the world. Dallas, Fort Worth, and they are a little bit of a distance from the border. So this affects more than just the border counties and cities. Now, I was in the Laredo sector and in the Rio Grande Valley sector. I'm not gonna go into a lot of those details today because on August 21st and the 22nd, 
when Brandon is here, you will get a full story of that. But I just want you to see this because the Laredo sector, according to Border Patrol, has giant gaps in it. This is a picture of a Border Patrol officer standing on the, on the Rio Grande River banks on the Texas side, and he is by himself. I can't begin to tell you the number of times that we encountered border agents completely by themselves. It's dangerous for them. I would ask you to pray for them and their families. The U.S. border agents, and when they talk about giant gaps, it means agents often have no ability to call for backup. Areas are left without agents assigned to patrol. When agents do respond to alerts, they are regularly alone in the field with little to no access to cell or radio communication. They have poor, defective, insufficient equipment. You think about the billions of dollars that our federal government waste studying the mating habits of gnats and everything else and and, and really, you know, d conducting surveys and, and, and uh, studies that tell people that men and women are different. <laughs> you think of the number of things that they spend are on issues, corporate welfare that is outside of the constitutional limits. And they can't equip the people that are supposed to be guarding our borders because you remember what James O'Keefe said. Right on the Border Patrol website, you will see that they talk about their purpose is to keep terrorists from coming into these United States. Now I can tell you that the border agents we talk to describe to us the ways in which their equipment is defective. And I'm not gonna uh, go into that here because frankly, this is being live streamed it's going to be archived, and I don't want to tell people, and I'm sure the criminals know more about their defective equipment than I do, but I don't want to put them in additional harm. But it is a shame on our government to leave these men and women exposed like this. By the way, they are eager to tell you that the state of Texas does provide excellent equipment for its Department of Public Safety officers, the Rangers and the, and the um, game wardens who are down there on the border. I saw it firsthand and they do have excellent equipment. What will the 1,000 National Guard personnel do? They're not yet deployed. Governor Perry has asked for, volunteer, for them on a volunteer basis. And as of yesterday, about 2,200 men and women have volunteered to go to the border. Governor Perry stated, the state's deployment of troops and the funding of Operation Strong Safety is intended simply as a stopgap measure until the federal government steps in. When do you think that's gonna happen? It's not gonna happen. It is not clear that all of the 1,000 National Guard personnel will actually be troops. Because you see, there's a whole lot of record keeping that's involved in an operation like this. So I want you to understand the facts here. There's a, there's a little bit of a difference, in fact, there's a great difference between some of the political rhetoric that you hear on Fox News, and I told you I'm straight on this, because you know what, your lives and the lives of Texans and the lives of law enforcement are on the line here, so you need to know the truth. We need to get this thing defined. So it's not clear that everybody that will be sent will actually be troops. You know, when the, when the word troop is used, I envision people suited up with guns with bullets in the guns, all right? That's not what we had. Governor Perry refused to provide specifics on numbers, the time frame, and the tactics, saying they did not want criminals to have that information. But you see, the mission charge 
was actually made public last week in a hearing in the Capitol, and I was sitting right there. So let's see what was said in that hearing that will tell you something about the mission. In the Texas House Committee on Homeland Security and Public Safety, which was August 5th, 2014, I was sitting there waiting to testify. Adjutant General John Nichols, he was in charge of the National Guard effort, said, when asked by the chairman to define the mission, what you've been told to do, he said, on the record, you can see it in our, it's archived video. What we've been asked to do specifically is to come support DPS and their Operation Strong Safety. He stated that the state of Texas has not asked the National Guard to detain suspected undocumented immigrants. And when I say the state here, I'm talking about the governor. My command to my folks is avoid confrontation. Our rules of engagement are really rules of non-engagement. Now, did y'all get that? I have to tell you that the grassroots leaders that were sitting with me in that hearing, we nearly came up out of our chairs when we heard that. Because I'm gonna have you heard that before? Is that what your impression was, that that's what we were doing by sending the National Guard? Okay. If undocumented immigrants try to turn themselves into National Guard troops, he said, the soldiers are instructed to ask them to sit down and wait for Border Patrol or DPS agents to arrive. Now I submit to you that the people who live in Virginia and Arizona uh, let's see, where else? Maybe Rhode Island, some of those people are concerned about an open border. When they see Governor Perry, and again, I, I don't have a personal animus toward Governor Perry, but he's in a pretty important position. He's the chief executive officer of our state. He has broad executive authority over law enforcement. And where I come from, words mean things. When we say, by golly, when the federal government's not going to secure the border, but in the state of Texas we're going to, I don't expect to hear the adjutant general say our rules of engagement are really rules of non-engagement. I don't expect to hear that. So what is happening here is Texas is actually participating in Obama's catch and release policy for illegals with some pretty fatal results. This is a picture of border agent Vega, who was murdered on August the 3rd by two illegals who had been deported multiple times. He was gunned down in cold blood while he was out on an outing, a fishing expedition with his parents, his wife, and his children and they saw him murdered by these two thugs. There's a price being paid here. And if you talk to law enforcement like we do all the time, they will tell you that the assaults on border agents, on DPS, are escalating. We've gone too far here. All officers are in danger because bullets don't follow jurisdictional lines. They don't. So if a bullet can get border agent Vega, it can get some of our DPS officers and some of our rangers and some of our game wardens. And I submit to you, they are real people with real families who love them and care about them and how dare our government use them without giving them what they need, the orders they need to do the job. As I said, there are 29 legal ports of entry in Texas and about 18 of those are bridges. You see that. There, there are plenty of ways to come over the border illegally. 
I submit to you, we need to stop tolerating the illegal entry. Now, this is important because you've heard me say over and over and over again that there are two reports that need to be considered. They're written by DPS, given to the legislature. I have to tell you, I encounter too many elected officials who don't even know these reports exist. And they're very important. They're posted on our website. One is the 2013 threat assessment that goes into the cartel activity and the transnational gangs that have set up elaborate, sophisticated networks all over the state of Texas. The other one is the gang assessment report that came out in April of 2014. I want you to look at the dark blue there that is the highest gang activity. You see down there on the border, you see uh, the clusters there of where the high gang activity is. Then you see some in the, in the Houston area. Then you see up there in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Then you see that dark blue county that's in East Texas. That's Smith County. So I submit to you the next time you have a conversation with elected officials who don't seem to really care that much about law enforcement, you might remind them that there's an important report that they need to look at that will tell you what our local PDs and Sheriff's Department and the DPS who work here, they encounter dangerous criminals all the time. We don't live in Mayberry anymore. And we need to stop pretending that we do. And Grassroots America is going to work with local law enforcement to bring community education on this issue. We've been talking about getting some DEA agents here, some people who can define for you what that activity looks like and what you need to be aware of and how you report it and how you stay safe. Beautiful East Texas also has, you see this area here? That's the territory that the La Familia cartel works in, Cover Smith County, and the Zetas cartel, and the Gulf cartel. We don't live in Mayberry anymore. So this is where we are today. It's a quote by Winston Churchill. The era of procrastination, of half measures, of soothing and baffling expedients, of delays is coming to its close, and in its place we are entering a period of consequences. Folks, we are about to enter the dire consequences because we've had too much political correctness and too many people who spit on the United States Constitution. This weekend, we're having a Gulf Coast Summit on the border crisis. 75 grassroots leaders will meet Saturday with a Texas Ranger and others with direct knowledge of this crisis. An action plan for Texas has been written by myself and Dale Holes of the Clear Lake Tea Party. We will present that action plan for group endorsement. It's going to include much of what Representative Schaefer will tell you today. The status quo is unacceptable because, quite frankly, the status quo is deadly. Now, I've talked to you about the 80% of the problem. Colonel McCraw, head of DPS, says that the vast majority of people coming over the border are not the children. I am talking to you about dangerous people. And I hope that you will take this very, very seriously. Thank you. Matt Schaefer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joanne, for keeping everybody informed. And I know you all have been tuned into Breitbart, Texas, and other news outlets that have been reporting a lot of the details. Uh, one of the things I want to convey to you is that the reason that Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador and Mexico are in the in the situation, what do I need to do? You're, you're blocking the screen. Blocking the screen. I'm tall. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the rule of law has failed in those countries. So the response to lawlessness is not further lawlessness. 
The response to lawlessness is to uphold and adhere to our sacred uh, legal documents and those inalienable rights that were given to us by God and embodied in the Constitution. So bottom line up front, it is bad, and there is no end in sight. But let me tell you, we, we have some things that we can do. We have things we should do. We have a legal framework in which to operate. Our game wardens, our DPS troopers, our local law enforcement officials, our Texas National Guard have the legal authority to arrest illegal aliens crossing the border for violation of federal criminal statutes. But then they must then turn them over to the feds. Okay? That's under our current legal framework. We are doing a better job. The DPS surge is beneficial. The Texas National Guard surge will be beneficial. But we can do a lot more. And we need more manpower, equipment, and more courage. Our Constitution does give us some options. But I believe that option is un untested. But it's there. We want to talk about it. All right, so I'm going to go through some facts and some myths that I've encountered in all my many discussions. And let me tell you, I have made myself a nuisance in, this, in the offices of our statewide leaders. I was gone for a couple of weeks doing my Navy duty, and my wife said, there's nobody in the living room yelling about the border. <laughs> First myth that I've heard, crossing the border without papers is a federal civil matter. That is a myth. Fact, it is a federal crime to cross the border without official authorization. What happens, that is a crime to come across the border, but once that person is arrested by a lawful entity, it does trigger essentially an administrative process under the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952. But it is a crime. What does the law say? 8 United States Code, Section 1325, improper entry by an alien. First offense, six months in prison is an option. Second offense, two years in prison is an option. That is federal law on the books right now. Crossing the river without papers is a federal crime. Don't let anybody tell you that it's not. And the Border Patrol agents will tell you that as well when you talk to them. Our immigration laws are complex. Indeed they are. We have different immigration rules for people from different parts of the world. Uh, we have different rules for people who've been here on a visa, and maybe it's expired. There are times, perhaps, that you could have a, a visa, a work visa or something that's expired, and they haven't gotten back to it. That may not be a criminal matter, but, but it is complex. Myth, the Texas National Guard cannot arrest or detain illegal aliens on the border. You know how many times I've yelled at Fox News? I got into a Brit Hume when we were talking about the Texas Guard going down the border. Brit Hume was on there. Well, they can't arrest anyway. They can't detain. I got on Twitter and found his Twitter handle and started tweeting him that you're wrong. And he responded. And I got into a Twitter exchange with Brit Hume saying they can detain. Yes, they're going to have to turn them over to federal authorities, but they absolutely can detain and arrest. Now, here's the fact. The Texas governor has the constitutional and statutory authority under Texas law and the U.S. Constitution to order them to arrest for a federal crime. Now, he has ordered them to deploy, but obviously he has not ordered them, given them the order to act, take that action. The law, what's the Texas law say in the government code? Right there, the governor may call state military forces to assist civil authorities, and they can help with executing law as the public interest or safety requires. Does anybody doubt that we are clearly within a public safety and a public interest um, situation? Don't let anybody tell you that we don't have the authority for the governor to go further. Myth, the Supreme Court ruled in Arizona v. U.S. that the state law enforcement cannot arrest illegal aliens for violation of federal immigration crimes. That is not what happened in the Arizona case. What the Supreme Court did in the Arizona v. U.S. case was that they struck down Arizona's new law, which created new criminal statutes at the state level that the Supreme Court said reached into the federal government's immigration responsibilities under the Supremacy Clause. But it also said police can still arrest for existing federal immigration crimes. And you've heard sheriffs from Arizona 
get on Fox News and Greta and others talk about, yes, we still can do that. In fact, we have a, a duty to ask about immigration status if we have a reasonable suspicion and turn them over to the feds, but the feds aren't doing anything. So what's the law? Right there, straight out of the Supreme Court's ruling, they have not prohibited state law enforcement from enforcing federal crimes. Existing federal immigration law. Texas can do more. Listen, there's been a lot of talk about the kids. That's appropriate. How can we not talk about it? But really, in sheer numbers, the problem is the adults. It's the influx of adults. It's the cartel activity that is just exploding. And, the, and most of the kids that are coming through really are, are teenage males. Uh, there are some younger children, but the, the largest number are the teenage males. What can we do? We need more boots on the ground, more boats and more personnel on the river, along the river. There are so many things that we can actually do. Let me tell you, most of these people don't want to get caught. Okay? I know a lot of them are turning themselves in, but the majority of them, they still fear apprehension for one reason or the other. So we need to put more people, literally, along the river to man the observation posts. We have Humvees in our um, table and organization of equipment at the National Guard. We have Humvees with sensors that can get out of the rough country. I just got back from El Paso, where, the, where a large port of entry is, is there. Let me tell you, talk to the Border Patrol commander. All these 18 wheelers that come through in you know, conducting trade and commerce that we want, they are only able to x-ray a, a fraction of them, a small fraction of them. Yet, even when they're doing that, they find large loads of, of heroin, of drugs, of, of all these sorts of things. So I asked the commander, I said, why don't you have more capacity to x-ray more trucks? He said, we have actually have less capacity than we had a few years ago because some of the equipment we have has become obsolete. And so I'm sitting here thinking, you know what? The state of Texas could step up and purchase some more extra equipment and help out the Border Patrol. The Border Patrol agent also told me that although the traffic has increased, their personnel and their manning has stayed flat. So do you think that we're actually, even in the lawful ports of entry, are we doing what we can to interdict all the drugs and the paraphernalia and the illicit uh, items that are coming through? We're not. We need more game wardens out in the brush where they know how to operate. We need more DPS troopers on the, on the roads. We're going to have to hire and pay for these folks above the river. Joanne keeps talking about these Border Patrol agents who are alone. They covet helicopter support. We actually, in uh, one of the Blackhawks that is going to be deployed with the National Guard right now, we have a quick reaction force team. We have guys who are trained to fast rope into remote locations to assist agents or uh, DPS troopers that are out in the brush and, are, and don't have access. Cell phone signals don't always work out there. Helicopter assets are so valuable. But let me tell you something. What we could do is if we gave the funding, we could go to Arkansas and Oklahoma and other states that have pilots and they have helicopters that would love to come over. If we could pay for it, they would come over and help us support us with their, with their helicopters. Another problem we have is that the helicopters that we have are Department of Defense assets, and the Department of Defense tries to pull them back sometime. We need more Texas-owned helicopter assets. Eyes in the sky, planes and UAVs. Right now, the FAA is not giving us authority to fly unmanned aerial vehicles along the border. I'd do it anyway. Let them sue us. <laughs> Welfare, benefit, integrity. Ultimately, we're going to have to start doing some things that sends a different message back to Mexico. I'll give you an example. In 2012, the state of Massachusetts, on their food stamp cards, said it's going to have to have your photo ID on it. Because they got tired of people passing these food stamp cards off as currency. It's happening here. They get to the end of the month, it's got a couple hundred bucks left on it, they sell it for cash. 
Well, we could, we could slow that down a little bit. If Massachusetts, one of the most liberal states in the country, can put photo ID on their food stamp cards, why can't we in Texas? Policy is going to have to change. The only way this is going to stop is if when people either show up to the river and they <coughs> are deported quickly or they can't even get across. That message has got to go back to Central America and to Mexico. We're going to have to have meaningful deportations and the cartel is going to have to feel some pain. But what is that going to require? It's going to require a change in federal law. You've heard about the 2008 law that treats Central Americans different than it treats Mexicans. Okay, they are, they are uh, under a different legal rubric. We've got to change that. But let me tell you something. It's not going to happen anytime soon. I have no faith in that whatsoever. Now, let me tell you, our state leaders, when you talk to them behind closed doors and to their staff, they don't think it's going to happen anytime soon either. They realize that the help is not coming from the federal government. So what if it doesn't stop? What if this continues? Let me tell you, the numbers are relatively lower than they were earlier on the apprehensions. It's still bad. Uh, Jed Quarles, my chief of staff, just got back from Border Tour and said the apprehensions last week were still up over around 6,000, I believe. They, the DPS told me that for every one that's apprehended, two are getting across. And remember, the apprehensions, that 6,000, this is essentially catch and release. They are being given a piece of paper saying report to a court here. It's being ignored wholesale. The deportations are a very, very small fraction of what's happening. So what do we do? We act on our own. We test new constitutional ground. The founders gave us a way out. Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3. You can, you can defend yourself if a state is in, feels like it's in imminent danger, as will not admit of delay. How quickly are we getting there? How quickly are we? So, if I'm governor for a day, what do I start thinking about doing? Go on offense. Use a Texas security force to operate inside Mexico against the cartels and the coyotes. I'm talking about raising the cost of doing business for them. Let me tell you, we can do this covertly. We can do it overtly. We can do it with, let me tell you, we have smart uh, military folks with a lot of experience. We could use intelligence to really only work when it was to our advantage and start making the cost of doing business for them and the human trafficking go way up. The Mexican state of Tamaulipas across from the Rio Grande Valley is ungoverned by the Mexican government. It is controlled by the cartels. And the cartels are even at war with themselves. When we say Mexican government do X, Y, and Z, they are incapable of that. You remember Juarez across from El Paso being such a problem in the news a while back, and now it's calmed down? When you ask the Border Patrol what happened, why did it calm down? They say, well, one cartel won. It's not because the Mexican government went in and cleaned house. It's ungoverned. I would create some kind of a buffer zone, strategic fencing, information ops. I would start doing some, some pretty sneaky uh, information ops in Mexico and Central America. I'd start putting some leaflets in, some messages out that maybe told them it wasn't a good idea to come north. Now, let me tell you, this idea is, is going to be considered radical by some people. You've got to make the cost of doing business for the cartels go up. They are making a tremendous amount of money off of human trafficking right now. The people that are coming up from Central America and Honduras, well, they're not coming all by themselves. They have connections in the United States that many of them are using to pay the coyotes to bring them forward. You've got to change the message in Central America. What can you do as grassroots folks? Pray and trust God. Ask statewide leaders who are in executive offices, not just legislative offices, to begin to come up with specifics of what they're going to do. And then as the appropriations process moves forward in the Texas House and the Texas Senate, the proof will be in the money. What 
money do we step up and apply towards the security against the fundamental role of state government and keep the heat on our federal officials as best we can? I want to leave you with this. Compassion, yes. Injustice, no. We have biblical mandate for that. In Exodus, it says you must not oppress the foreign resident. We are to always provide mercy. But justice is there too. Do not show favoritism to a poor person in a lawsuit. God wants truth as we deal with the poor. God wants mercy as we deal with the foreigner. We've got to do both. Or we, in the end, in the long run, if we ignore the laws of our nation, what message have we given to Central America, to Mexico, the places where, why don't they have foreign investment that keeps their economy going? Because the corporations are afraid of their assets being seized, because the cartels control, because the drug lords are there, because you can't do oil and gas business the way you should in a country where the law is upheld. We've got to turn the corner, folks. And uh, let me tell you, we're going to keep making a nuisance of ourselves. We're going to keep spreading the message. We have a political problem in the state of Texas. We have a number, or, or a lot of our um, Democrat colleagues, they are not on board with this. I've talked to them. I've talked to border reps. They are not on board with this um, for various reasons. I'm gonna, I don't want to take up all the time because I want to turn it over to my colleagues. But let me tell you something. Uh, we're going to keep pressing. We're going to keep pressing, and uh, I'm going to be. I'm going to be. I'm going to trust in God that we're going to get uh, some progress made on this. She's thankful to have Matt Schaefer in the Texas House. Uh, <laughs> My name is Brian Hughes. Many of us have met before, and if you live in actually a big part of Smith County, northern, uh, eastern, or even part of the southern part, uh, I represent you in the legislature. I also cover Wood County, Raines, Camp, Morris, and Titus County. Uh, right here uh, where we all live. And so many folks here live in my district, many are in Matt's or David's. We all work for you. You're all Texans. You're all taxpayers. And uh, as Dr. King said in a different context, uh, we might have gotten here on different ships, uh, but we're all in the same boat now. And certainly in this context, we're all affected equally by the crisis that we're dealing with. And so a couple of things. Matt has, uh, has covered the ground very well. Let me give you a little more bad news and then some slightly better news. Uh, we talked about how when these folks are apprehended, uh, this uh, catch and release policy, you know, Lake Fork is in my district, and so catch and release used to be a good thing, used to be a happy thing we talked about, but it has a whole new meaning now. You know that, uh, catch and release. And so uh, folks were told, you know, now we're going to arrest you, but you come back in 15 days for your hearing, okay? Okay, you can go now. And it's not surprising that only about 25% of those folks return for their hearings. And so the latest numbers we have right now, there are about 800,000 people uh, at large in the country today who've been detained at the border, told to report for their hearing and didn't make it. So 800,000, of course, that numbers are growing. So that's the numbers that we know about right now. And of course, uh, when the administration ships these people all over the country before they're released, that only makes that worse. And we, we get that. We understand what that's about. Briefly about the cartels, and Matt covered this very well, but when I was last at the border back in June, uh, we learned a lot about this because some of us will recall back in June, that's when we were uh, first getting a lot of media reports about these unaccompanied minors, right? Hearing more about that. And uh, everyone wondered where are these kids coming from? And we learned it's not exactly a new problem, but there is a reason for it. Matt talked about the drug cartels. There's a couple of things they're doing. Of course, they're making money. If these families pay them thousands of dollars to bring themselves or their children up here. And many times, Many times after those cartels uh, have gotten their customers to the border, 
after they get them here, in many cases, they hold those people for ransom and extort more money from their relatives in the U.S. before they let them go, if they let them go. And so they're making money in the process, but also, we get this, they're bringing these unaccompanied minors up here so they can overwhelm the system, right? So they can tie up all our resources and free up uh, open areas for them to do all the evil stuff they're doing. And they're doing some pretty scary stuff. Uh, I've learned recently, in fact, that some of the documents that Joanne told you about are available on the DPS website. It's really interesting. This is all public information. Have you ever heard of a clone vehicle? You know what a clone vehicle is? In this context, the drug cartels operating in Texas, for example, have black SUVs, black Tahoes with dark tinted windows, black wheels, look just like a government vehicle. They even have flashing lights that go off. And so as a result, they can try to get past our law enforcement. They can also take advantage of citizens, of, of people who don't know any better. Uh, there was one case where a school bus, these folks had commandeered a school bus and were using that for their drug cartels. Also, clone vehicles can be AT&T trucks. They've caught a couple of those where these guys will paint up a truck that, and even put the AT&T logo on the side. So when people see that in the neighborhood, they're not raising any suspicion. And the good news is DPS is on to what they're doing. And as Matt said, uh, what this surge is about is to raise the cost of doing business for these drug cartels. And it's starting to make some improvement. But one thing that we have to mention also, of course, is the corruption. Uh, we know about this even in America, but where the war on drugs is involved, there is so much money, uh, just ungodly amounts of money. And so inevitably, because we're all fallen sinners, we're all humans, Inevitably, we have public officials uh, in various fields who succumb uh, to that temptation. The uh, sheriff of Hidalgo County was just indicted a few weeks, well, a few months ago uh, for this corruption, for being in bed with these folks, taking money from them. Uh, we, we know how horrible the situation is in Mexico where the law enforcement officers that do try to take a stand and do the right thing end up getting killed or or worse, or things happen to their families. Again, we're in good shape in Texas so far, but the corruption is not stopping at the border. And on that note, I wanna underscore something that Matt said and Joanne said. Of course, we're a nation of immigrants. Uh, our relatives all came here from somewhere else, some further back than others. We're a nation of legal immigrants, folks that came in the front door. But let's just talk about this issue politically. There are many people who tell us, I'm not gonna assume we're all Republicans, but let's say, uh, folks tell the Republicans, don't talk about this border stuff. You're just going to alienate voters. You know, you can't win any elections if you do that. Now, how many of us know that if you do the right thing and you take a stand, the elections will take care of themselves? We okay with that if we do that? That's what we believe in here. I know that. We also know that this border crisis is not a racial issue. Uh, my goodness, most of the border agents that we met with, the state and federal, were of Hispanic origin. Uh, in Hidalgo County, uh, our DPS and Border Patrol worked with Sheriff Guerra. His family was on that area before there was a Texas, before there was a Mexico. Uh, this is not a racial thing with him. We work with Constable Larry Gallardo, who helps with our boats going up and down the river, and Chief of Police Viescas in FAR. This is not a racial issue. This is an American security issue. I know we all understand that. The other side wants to drag us off into other areas, but it's a security issue for all of us, no matter what our last name is. And so the encouraging thing is, the encouraging thing is the surge is starting to work. Y'all heard about the surge, of course, and uh, uh, no one is gonna take this stage and tell you the border is secure or tell you there's no problem. There are real problems. The good news is Texas is having some successes. Now, uh, Matt has been to the border. Uh, David's been down there. I've been down there. We've each made, been down there more than once. The last time I was there was in June, and we got to go on the border on some of these boats. And I think you'll find this interesting. Now, the uh, U.S. Border Patrol, they have boats that go up and down the Rio Grande. That's the federal officers. And we're thankful for those federal officers. They do a wonderful job. Uh, we wish they weren't so limited by their higher-ups and what they can do. But we have some wonderful federal Border Patrol. And so there's U.S. Border Patrol boats that go up and down the Rio Grande. There are also Texas DPS. The Texas Highway Patrol actually has boats on the Rio Grande River. Uh, for a while, I wasn't saying how many, but they assure me it's public record. Well, we have six really uh, impressive and really formidable boats, well-armed with 
uh, eight machine guns on each one. We've been on those boats, been up and down the river. There are more boats on the way, by the way, but we have eight at this point. And here's, yeah, <laughs> we're getting more. And well, a couple of things we've learned. Some of our, in some areas, our boats are too big to get back into those shallow areas of the river, like we saw in the video. And so more boats are coming. We already have the first one that goes back into the shallow areas. But here's something interesting about those boats. So U.S. Border Patrol boats, they're painted up with U.S. Border Patrol insignia. And uh, I guess this is pretty much in the public domain. It's reported that the Border Patrol's rules of engagement uh, tell them when they're on the river, if they're fired upon, they withdraw. Now, that's kind of been reported widely. I think it's pretty widely known. So U.S. Border Patrol boats, if they're fired upon in the river, they withdraw. Now, the cartels are not stupid. They've kind of figured that out, right? Now, one important distinction between the U.S. Border Patrol boats and the Texas DPS boats. The Texas DPS boats, if you shoot at them, they shoot back. Even <laughs> and it didn't take very long for word to get out, so it won't surprise you, nobody shoots at those Texas DPS boats when they go up and down the river. Now we know the cartels have spotters, we saw some when we were down there, and when the boats are in the area, the cartels get out of there, they don't do anything. Now when the boats leave, the cartels come back, so what's the answer to that? Like Matt said, more boats, more guys, more helicopters. At the end of the day, there's been a lot of attention about these children that are turning themselves in. But as Matt said, let's don't forget, most of these folks are still trying to evade detection. And if you have more people with badges and guns and cowboy hats <laughs> on the river, you're going to have fewer people crossing. That's pretty well human nature. We understand it. So we're making some progress. And let's talk briefly about the numbers, all right? The surge, this DPS surge began back in June. And y'all remember what that was. We've had, we've had troopers down there for a while, but because of the crisis, in response to requests from David and Matt and others, uh, the governor and the DPS said, we're gonna send more guys down there. So you probably know, uh, over the last six years, we've spent about $600 million on border security. And that's Texas tax dollars, not federal. That's our money going for border security, about $600 million. In addition to that, Starting in late June, we're spending an extra $1.3 million a week. You know, we're all conservatives here. I hate the way those numbers just roll off my tongue. But don't you agree this is a legitimate place for us to be putting our tax dollars if we have to spend it somewhere? It's just that we have to spend it. So what's that money going for? More DPS troopers on the border, more equipment. Also, those local county sheriffs and constables and city officers, they're getting more support from more officers on the ground. And it's really what Matt's talking about. We want to bust up those drug cartels. We're on, the, we're on the river. We're also messing with the drug cartels. We're infiltrating the organizations. We're busting up their safe houses where they keep their drugs. We're aggressively messing with them to raise the cost of doing business because we want them to go to jail or to go somewhere else to do their evil deeds. Is that okay with you guys if we do that with the drug cartels? That's what the surge is about. And we're thankful it is making a dent. And Matt alluded to this. Uh, you would expect, uh, you would expect with the surge, if we send a bunch more officers down there, we're going to be apprehending more people, right? Makes sense. A lot of folks are getting away. So if we send more officers, apprehensions will go up. And that happened. So when the surge began, we sent all these extra troopers. I bet many of you know troopers who've been down there. All of our troopers are doing tours on the border. I talked to one yesterday who was doing that. When we sent the troopers down there, uh, apprehensions went up. And when the surge was just getting, getting started, we were apprehending about 6,600 a day, 6,600 people trying to cross the border illegally. But remember, we've been saying the logic that armed guys with badges and guns on the border are going to decrease the number of crossings. The last numbers, we, I just got these numbers from DPS this morning. Uh, the crossings that people were catching now with all these extra officers in June were at 6,600 a day. Now they're at 2,900 a day. Now that's, I'm not sorry, a week, pardon me, a week, 2,900 a week. Now that's too many. That's a lot of people, but the surge is starting to have an effect. Now it's not enough. We need more. As Matt said, more equipment, more troopers, uh, more boots on the ground, but we're making a little progress. Briefly, one issue that's looming out there that's got to be dealt with is the issue of federal lands along the border. 
How many of us know that when there's a nature preserve, even if it's state or federal, in these nature preserve areas, uh, there's limits. You know, you can't take any motorized vehicles, certain areas you can't go back. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And that's one thing when it's a nature preserve up here that we all enjoy. But there are many of these federal preserves along the Rio Grande River, all right? And the same rules apply. No motorized vehicles, certain places you can't go. Now, obviously the drug cartels don't abide by those rules. They're in there with motorized vehicles. Did you know that the U.S. Border Patrol is bound by those rules? I wish I were making this up, but on these federal lands, yeah, the federal rules prevent the federal border patrol from enforcing federal immigration law. No motorized vehicles. You can't go into certain areas. It, it's crazy. That's not the border patrol's fault. That's the administration's fault. Now, our great congressman, Louis Gilbert, uh, in the House, they've already passed a bill to fix this, but it's met Harry Reid over in the Senate. So maybe in January that's going to change and we'll have somebody else in the Senate. But that's got to be fixed. That's just crazy. Add horses to the list. Horses. I'm into that. That makes so much sense. Now, here's what here's what DPS is doing. You'll, you'll be. I think you'll be pleased to know this. In these in these federal areas where the you're not supposed to go in there, if the DPS, if Texas officers are in hot pursuit of a of a suspect, they go in those areas with a motorized vehicle, whatever it takes. They don't stop. And, and because we know. When I was down there, the Border Patrol chief told me, the Border Patrol chief told me that 90% of the illegal activity is in these federal areas. They're not stupid, are they? So what does DPS do? We can't go in there normally with motorized equipment, so we mass on the outside. So the border's here, federal lands are here, your friendly DPS trooper is right here waiting for them to come through. So Texas is responding, dealing with it with the situation we have. There's more to do. There's still a lot of progress to make, but if Texas is leading the way for the rest of the states, that's not unusual, is it? So we're encouraged about that. And so I'm gonna yield in a moment to, uh, to my friend David Simpson, who uh, represented much of Smith County in his first term, and now has Greg in Upshur County, is known really across Texas and even nationally as a leader, as someone that doesn't mind standing up and even standing alone sometimes. Uh, he's got some help. He's got some help in Austin, doesn't have to stand alone, but we're thankful for him. And let me just say this, I may, I may or may not be answering questions, speaking to you again. Let me just say this, our country, our country uh, is in a real crisis. It's uh, as difficult a time as we've been in since I've been alive. Now, a few people here a little older than me and maybe remember some tough times. But let me tell you this, just on a personal note from my heart, let me urge each one here who loves your country. Now, you're involved, that's why you're here. You're praying, you're working. Let me just urge each one here to make sure to make sure that you have a right relationship with the Lord Jesus. Make sure that your sins are forgiven, you put your faith in him, because this is a great country. We're gonna keep fighting for it, but I'm glad this isn't all we have. I'm glad my citizenship is in heaven, and I encourage each of you to make that right while you can. It's open to everyone. And so, I'm honored to get to represent you in the legislature. Uh, it's a little part-time job. It pays $600 a month, and nothing to get excited about but it's a real honor to get to cast those votes and to stand there for the folks I represent. And so I'm proud to do that with Matt and with my friend David Simpson, who I'll introduce now. David, you come. Howdy. Howdy. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, address you. Uh, just to continue where Brian left off there. Uh, we stand on your shoulders. Um, we covet your prayers. Uh, I'm in my second term serving now Greg and Upshur counties. I used to serve Northern Smith. But the longer you're there, the harder it is to do the right thing. Amen. So pray for us that God would give us integrity, that he would give us wisdom, encouraged to do what's right. Uh, ultimately though, our, as Psalm 146 says, our hope is not in Austin, Brian, Matt, or me, uh, or Washington. It's in the Lord who reigns today and forever. There is a place for government, but force can only do so much. What we really need to do is to pray for revival and for reformation hearts 
and minds. I'd like to just briefly go through a few slides and uh, I'm going to bypass Oh, here we go. I'm supposed to do this. Uh, here we go. I'm going to just give a brief overview of what I want to do today. And I'm going to speed through most of this. I want to talk about the numbers, then about the laws and policies, and some reforms on the federal and state level, and some broad principles are, are really the target of what we want to preserve. And then along with that talk about our messaging. First of all about the numbers. Uh, I want to give a breakdown about the illegal entries. First of all they are overwhelming uh, but they're not unprecedented. I'll get to that. First you'll see here in this slide um, about 25 percent of the illegal entries that of course people that were detaining. And so qualify that whole slide by that, and there are other people that are coming that, that we're not detaining. But those that we are detaining, 25% of them are Mexican, and then about 20% of those are minor children, and at least when we find them unaccompanied. Um, then 30% are families with children, and then 25% are basically other. Um, adults uh, primarily. But with respect to the Mexicans, we do repatriate them same day. And I'm thankful for that. That doesn't always get out. But with respect to the children and the families, they are seeking really asylum. Um, now, many of them probably or may not receive that, but that's what they're, they're ones coming and just giving themselves uh, they're not seeking to avoid arrest, I think, for the most part. Uh, the others probably are. Um, that gives you a little overview of what's happening. That's about um, the, the breakdown. The, the, the number of Mexicans is between 20 and 25 percent. So that may vary a little bit or change things. I'd like to show now this slide uh, speaking about the numbers. Um, first of all, notice the exponential increase between fiscal year 2013 and 2014. We went from 30,000 to 110,000 families and children. A 276% increase. And then Notice as well, Texas makes up about 80%, 88%, almost 90% of all those detained on the southwest border of families and minor children. And then for uh, 2014, based upon those results published by the Customs and Border Patrol, we're going to see an increase by the end of the fiscal year of about 130. Uh, total about 132,000 or 351 percent increase. And as I said, this is not a wholly new problem. Uh, we did encounter, this is 2014 as of the end of May, 162,000 other than Mexicans, and 2013, 153. Back in 2005, we did have 165,000 people come as well. And it's a shame that we didn't learn then how to handle this problem. But things are not only overwhelming down there, they're dysfunctional. I've heard a little bit about this and I'm not going to dwell on it, but the promise to appears, the tickets that are given to these immigrants because we can't handle all the processing at once, is basically uh, undermining the rule of law. And they're calling back home that's the second point there. And they're telling families that they've received a permissio. They received their permission to enter the country. And that's, in fact, really de facto true. They're, at that point, somewhat uh, legally here, even though it hadn't been finally determined. Uh, the other thing that's 
dysfunctional is we are entrusting these children to families that we haven't fully vetted. And many of them are probably also here illegally. And they might even uh, prey upon those children. And it's a, it's a tragedy. The dis there's other dysfunctionalities. If you compare what we do with the legal entries to illegal, with respect to background checks, we take about two years for legal entries or applications. Just a matter of days for illegal. Medical screenings are cursory, and they're more in-depth for those who are coming legally. It's just upside down. And then we provide K-12 through education for students, but they're not going to be able to receive a driver's license. And if we implement E-Verify, these educated students are not going to be able to get to work, get to work legally. We have a dysfunctional system. We attract illegal entry and residents here in our country by providing uh, a lot more health care than just what is critical in emergency and by applying, by giving them education. We'll talk more about that just briefly. Um, we need, we also attract immigrants to this country because we have a vacuum. We were paying people almost two years not to work. Thankfully, that has been suspended now, and it's, it's about a half a year. But uh, that's wrong, and uh, that causes people not to get a job when they can go to the mailbox. We have basically laws and policies that have produced this situation, and it's not just under Obama. It's not just in the last few years. It's been decades in the making, but there are uh, the... 2008 law about human trafficking has been abused and has led to many unintentional consequences. No doubt many of the children uh, perhaps are truly fleeing very desperate situations. Honduras has the worst murder rate in the world of 90 out of 1,000. Um, and frankly, I, I don't blame some of the people for coming. No, I, they should come legally. But if you're burnt, leaving a burning building and you jaywalked to flee danger, I dare say that we, we wouldn't really talk about jaywalking. We'd be talking about them fleeing to safety. There is a place for mercy. And our, this law was, in 2008, recognized that. But it has had some unintended consequences. And no doubt many people are being trained just to say that they are seeking asylum and creating some uh, uh, fiction, perhaps. But then again, there may, well may be serious safety issues, and we do not want to turn our back upon those people and send them back to be trafficked, to be enslaved, to be perhaps murdered if they don't run packages for the drug cartel. But of course, the other issue is recently, in 2012, our president instituted by himself the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program. Y'all probably all heard a lot about this before, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But that has really exacerbated the problem and aggravated it. And if you compare the number of deportments uh, from President Bush to President Obama, they decrease substantially uh, through the last 10 years. It's interesting, though, under Obama, the forced deportments have actually increased. Well, what can the U.S. do? Well, we can provide more resources at the border. We've already talked about that. We can allow uh, law enforcement to go into those federal uh, areas along the border that were prevented now, except for the DPS when they're in hot pursuit. Uh, we can swiftly deal with the, those who are seeking asylum at the border, at the border, and quickly. It's more expensive and, uh, to send these children all over the place. And we need, if, we, if, it, if it's beyond our limits, we just say we can't do anymore, and we, we have to just send them back. Most of us, if we had a crisis and we needed to receive people in our home and give them food, 
We'd do as much as we can, but then there would be a limit. And we'd have to just turn them away, and others would have to pick up the slack, or they'd just have to fend them for themselves. There's only so much we can do. We need to reduce government welfare and rely upon charity. When the government enters into charity, so to speak, it's a subsidy, and it actually attracts more and makes people more dependent. When we do it voluntarily, we withdraw that when it is abused because we love the person too much. The government just wants to make a bigger job for itself. Let's see there. And then, perhaps the most important, but maybe the most difficult to accomplish is we need to require legal status for birth by citizenship at least. Well, what can Texas do? Well, I have to excuse me, I can't read my own slide here. Yeah, I wanna to try to face you all up. We need to require compliance with the federal law. We could ask when they come to our public schools, make sure that they have appeared as they promised. And we could track those numbers which would help us in our argument with the federal government. Uh, we could reduce the sa government safety net to a more reasonable levels by reducing unemployment payments and providing only emergency health care that is critical. And then uh, we need to overturn the mandate to educate aliens who have entered the country illegally or who are still residents of Mexico. We have many who are crossing the, the bridges with cards, entering our schools at our expense and then returning home to Mexico every day. I didn't get to see it, I did hear about it by David Watts who witnessed it, but I was down there during uh, summer break. Uh, what we need, how do we do that? Well, we overturn a case called Plyler versus Doe. And I'm gonna let the attorneys talk more about that if they need to, but that case arose here in Smith County in 1977 and was decided by the Supreme Court in 1982 that basically requires us to provide free education to, uh, to uh, illegal immigrants or undocumented school-aged children. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna just pass over that, but there's a way we could do it, uh, but it would, uh, it would end up, uh, if we pass the law, uh, it would no doubt be immediately contested and we'd have to take it all the way to the Supreme Court, so it's not an immediate solution. One thing I wanna just briefly talk about, and that is effective messaging. This is a very emotional issue. It's probably the hottest issue. We need to keep in mind that our goal is not just to secure the border. Our goal is to change the hearts and minds of our neighbors so that they understand why that is important. If we don't do that, it'll be quickly opened again and, and not controlled. And so we need to keep that in mind. We, can't, we need to engage people with meekness, that's gentle strength, with wisdom and patience. We need to avoid the harsh rhetoric and remember a soft answer turns away wrath. And we need to try to find some common ground with people when we are talking about this issue and debating it. Many times the Tea Party is ineffective in my estimate, and I count myself a part of it because we are not meek. We're pictured as just putting the babies and the children in a catapult, sending them back on the other side of the river, pointing a gun. I've heard it said, just take over Mexico. And I said, well, how'd that work in Iraq? I've heard, well, let's, let's shoot two or three of those children and they'll rest and learn it. That's not the way to do things. We, we do not want to become like the countries that these people are fleeing. We want to uphold the rule of law and we want to have mercy. Mercy makes no sense except in the context of justice. We need to speak the truth in love and we need to pray that the truth would enter the heart and the mind. 
You know, that's a problem in Iraq. We've used a lot of force over there, and probably a trillion or two dollars. But it's going right back the way it was. The gospel is what we need, where people are changed from the inside out. Well, I'm not pretty much out of time, so I just end with these broad principles. What should we be shooting for in the right way? What's our target? What's our goal? It's to secure and control the border. We don't want to be like Berlin, where we wall people out and wall people in, like the U.S., the Soviet Union. We want freedom of travel and movement, but we want to stop the wrongdoer. We want to stop the drug cartels. We want to stop the terrorists. We need to enforce the laws and the penalties and distinguish between serious crimes and crimes of, of lesser violations against order. We don't, we don't punish traffic violations the same way we do vandalism, theft, and murder, thankfully. Now, if it's aggravated, it can be a serious penalty. But I dare say some of us have acted illegally already here today. We, we need not to be good Pharisees or scribes. And we need to remember to apply the same law, even though some people have come here in the wrong way. And I do believe we need to talk about not only controlling the border and securing it, but we need to talk about that there is a place for asylum and for refugees. Our Puritan forefathers were such and many of those here. But we did turn away lots of Jews at the end of World War II, regrettably. And we need to talk about a reasonable, understandable way of facilitating and increasing, in my opinion, legal immigration and ultimately, in some cases, naturalization. Anyway, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to you. And I'm pretty much through with uh, my slides. I just would close with, with, with this two slides real quick. The scripture says, excuse me, in Proverbs 20, uh, 14, 28, in the multitude of a people is a king's honor, but the lack of a people is the downfall of a prince. You know, our greatest resources are not oil and gas. They're people. They're like you and me. And our forefathers who came here from other places. And we need to remember that as we talk about this. These, these people right here are Mexicans. And they were on a train coming to South Texas when most of the men were either in the Pacific fighting for freedom or in Europe fighting for freedom. And we would not have harvested our crops in South Texas without them. And those men wouldn't have gone without their help. The other thing we need to remember that most people, not the terrorists, not the criminals, but there are a lot of people coming for hope. 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 But true hope is not in dependence upon the government. But as Lady Liberty held in her arms there on that tablet, had marked July 4th, they, they're coming and they should come. And we should allow them to come if they're hardworking and fear God and will keep our laws for independence, just like our forefathers. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate your attention. Okay. Let's get our questions. David, you've got the honor of having the first question. Okay, who has it? Uh, it says, why has the majority of the increase of illegals been in the Rio Grande sector, lower Rio Grande Valley up to the Dallas-Fort Worth area? Well, it's because of the uh, easy access, or I shouldn't say easy, the most readable access by trains and roads, uh, the shortest distance between South America and um, the Rio Grande Valley. It's a lot farther to Del Rio, Presidio, um, El Paso. Um, and if y'all remember, you've probably seen pictures of the trains. They ride a train called the Beast, and they ride on top of it. It's very dangerous. 
but the Mexican government countenances it, and uh, that's how they come. Also, I do believe it's because the, the focus, the, the, there's so many federally protected lands in that portion of our border with Mexico. If you'll pass that to Matt, please. Why are some border, let dem, border and in parentheses Democrat legislative reps not interested in a full offensive tactic on the border issue, which is so impacting their districts? How much is due to corrupt elected officials? I think that they view it differently. When you go to places like El Paso, uh, for its size, El Paso is one of the safer cities in America because the type of activity that happens there is not this kind of uh, gang violence that we see. It's different. They feel safer there. Their constituency also is much more interested in the type of welfare programs uh, and uh, social benefits that they, uh, they're receiving right now and uh, they do want more lenient uh, immigration laws. Their own constituencies are telling them don't tighten border policy, but loosen it and move this towards a, a change in the policy. So for a number of reasons, uh, they, they want their immigration laws changed in their favor uh, and don't want to any, do anything that would push it back the other direction. Okay, those are the only ones I have specifically addressed to an individual. What will it take to get our governor to act responsibly? <laughs> well, he's on his way out in a few months. Uh, I can tell you that Governor Perry has taken some action that uh, he's had to push back against probably the Speaker of the House. He has had to push back against members of his own party. So uh, can we sit here and maybe say Governor Perry should do more and can do more? Yes. Uh, but to his credit, he has done more than many would. Uh, so I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I think the more relevant point will be to see what kind of specific actions uh, Greg Abbott is going to lay out for us. Following that up, should Governor Rick Perry use the Texas Guard to secure our border? Absolutely, I'd do much more. Is it correct that the federal government counts as deportation the giving of the court date paper to illegals? Obama's administration brags about the huge number of deportations they've done. I don't believe them. I don't know the answer to that. Do you, David? Yeah, repeat the question. I think I understood you. Just when someone is, is told to show up for the hearing, do they count that as deportation? I, I can't answer that. I, I can I can say, as I mentioned in my slide presentation, that Obama's forced deep, deportations have been more than President Bush's. But overall, has been substantially less. That's a different answer to a different question, but. How do the families who have limited means get thousands of dollars to pay the coyotes? Uh, two primary ways. One is they have relatives and friends in the United States that are going to Western Union and sending them money. Uh, secondly, there is an economy in South, South, uh, Central America and Mexico. The drug economy still exists. So they do, it may be their life savings, but many of them are getting money by wire transfer from the United States, from relatives and friends there. Can you explain how Obama and the left can get votes by illegal people who are not citizens and really not even eligible to vote? <laughs> Obviously that's why voter ID is so important and that's why they fight us so hard on that. Uh, so uh, that's why we need to push back on that. Please explain the role of a game warden in the border issues. Okay, so the game wardens are, uh, of course, they're certified Texas peace officers, well-trained, know the way around the woods. So in addition to DPS troopers, pardon, we're sending a lot of game wardens down there, and they're spending extra time on the border. And they're certified peace officers, well-armed, they communicate with DPS and with Border Patrol. So they're doing great work. I mean, they're making arrests, they're stopping people from crossing. 
When are we going to invite the Texas militia to help defend the border? When is Texas going to repeal and deport regardless of what the feds say? So uh, the Texas, ha Texas has what's called the Texas State Guard that is not under the authority of the federal government. However, uh, this is not the type of uh, security force that you think of when you think of National Guard or law enforcement. They, they don't have guns, they're, they're professionals, they're smart guys and have professional uh, expertise, but they're not the kind of guys that you would put out in the field and they're a very small number of them. One thing I am interested in doing uh, is perhaps uh, advancing an initiative that would give the governor a greater authority to create a border-focused force, security force that's owned and operated and resourced and under the authority of the governor and could never be subject to recall by the president. And I think there is some constitutional basis for that. I, I'm just going to suggest something here for study. We've been mainly focused on Article 1, Section 8, dealing with uniform laws of naturalization and making and enforcing the laws of, of, of nations. Uh, but, and then in Tim, what the state can and cannot do, uh, particularly under emergencies, uh, what they can do. But in Section 9, which deals primarily with the migration and importation at the time it was written of slaves, it's interesting that it, it prohibited the federal government from prohibiting the states from importing certain persons or allowing people to migrate. And it says you shall not prohibit them from uh, migration and, and importation until 1808. And of course, we know that's when the slave trade ended. But it's interesting as it talks about there in that clause, as such states shall admit, and I don't know that it's limited merely to uh, slaves. And so, uh, to me, Section 8 points the way to a concurrent jurisdiction for immigration and that the states were seen as sovereign themselves and that the, they were to work together through the federal government. Um, anyway, I'm not an attorney, I'm not a constitutional expert, but I have not seen anything that undermines that. There may be, and there's probably a lot of federal law that would probably hinder us from going in that direction. But I do think it's a nugget, a beachhead that we might want to pursue in establishing concurrent jurisdiction with the federal government for immigration. When children are turned over to family members, are the family members paid to care for them until a trial? Not to my knowledge. I will say that under current United States Department of Agriculture policy, when you read their stuff right off their website, refugees and asylees are entitled to food stamps without delay. Why are border stations moved 45 miles further away from the border? Won't that allow for a more lawless area within the area of the borders and 45 miles from it? It doesn't make any sense. It, it's, it's a policy of this president. It just doesn't make any sense. And I would only follow up, that's what the feds do. Our DPS troopers are right there. They're on the border. They're much closer. But yeah, those checkpoints are pretty far back. Has the decrease in number coming across, is it because of the heat? As a matter of fact, the, the, the number of unaccompanied minors has decreased some, and that may be because of the heat, also because of problems with the train in Mexico. I was checking on that this morning. The number of unaccompanied minors is down a little bit, but we're not sure why, and it may be because of the heat. It's a 1,400-mile trek across Mexico. It's probably pretty tough. What is Senator L. Tyf's position on these issues? I, I haven't spoken. I saw in the paper where he called. He said we should have a special session to deal with it. I haven't spoken to him personally about it, but y'all may know. I, I, read, I saw where he said that in the paper where he wants to deal with the problem, but I'm, I don't know any specifics. Y'all know. What are we doing about the illegals that are already here? Well, of course, uh, obviously voter ID, which I mentioned, uh, it sounds like a broken record, but it's an important broken record. We want to make sure that only voters are voting. 
Uh, as far as that goes, Matt talked about how folks seeking asylum qualify for food stamps. I want to clarify one thing. In Texas, for Medicaid, food stamps, children's health insurance program, those programs are for citizens only, U.S. citizenship or legal resident, and that has to be verified. So some states are really opening things up and offering all kinds of benefits. Texas is not one of those states. Now, some things the feds require us to offer, but for the big ticket welfare programs, Medicaid, children's health insurance program, uh, those are for U.S. citizens or legal residents only. Okay. This is an FYI for you gentlemen. Brandon Darby and James O'Keefe were promoting your presentation live and it was on Ustream TV. Yeah, I don't know, uh, I don't want to hijack the program, but I know everyone's going to want to point this out. We talked about the border. I know one member of the U.S. Congress has been to the border probably more than any other. I've been there with him. He's been a, he goes in the middle of the night. He goes back where you're not supposed to go. He visits the detention centers. And that's our great congressman, my mentor, Judge Louis Gilmert, who's just come in. And yeah. sure he's here. Joanne, I have a question. Could the video please be put on Facebook so that it can be gotten out? Yes. Did y'all hear her? Yes. Last question. Well, this question I have no more for them. This probably is for you. Does Grassroots America support reduced legal immigration to pre-1965 levels? of reforms that need to take place. If you ever look at the uh, flow chart of what it looks like, the steps that it takes to become an American citizen, it looks like you're looking down into a bowl of spaghetti. Mm -hmm. It is a bureaucratic laden nightmare. It should not take people 10, 15, 20 years to become an American citizen if they really want to. It should be streamlined, but it is a bureaucratic nightmare. And by the way, before we start, you know, reversing the clock, we need to get what's on the books. The laws on the books need to be done right. They need to be followed. Because we have people that overstay their visas all the time. You know, words mean things. So if you're supposed to be here, for a specific amount of time, we need to have the enforcement in place and make sure that does not happen. Now, we're going to wind up. Um, I'm going to remind you all that if you're a member, you need to stay here for just a few minutes. It won't take but just a little bit. I also need to remind you about next Thursday evening. The information's on your table. Or next Friday, you need to be here is a continued uh, education series on the border crisis with Brandon Darby. I'm hoping he brings Il Defonso Ortiz, um, an undercover, uh, a guy that does a lot of investigative reporting and some border agents. So I invite you all to be here.